Hello. Welcome to this series of uh, webinars uh, that's based on trench rescue. Uh, today we're going to cover just a little bit of trench rescue, uh, a couple of different things, uh, some tips and some tricks, what to do with Paratech. My name is Nigel Leatherby. I'm the training manager for Paratech. I'll be doing this series of webinars. Uh, hopefully, for the advanced one in January, uh, we may be able to get a, an expert to come in to do this. Uh, I don't know if you're all familiar with him. You should be if you, if you follow Trench Rescue. But I'm looking to get Ron Zalaki in here to do this from uh, Musa Training Foundation. Uh, they, they, he heads up the FEMA Trench Operations Guide now. Uh, you're all familiar with the USA Field Operations Guide. FEMA are now doing one for trench, and he's heading up that with a bunch of PhDs and everything else, and some words behind their names I can't pronounce. So all to do with soil, gravity, and everything else. This PowerPoint presentation is for informational purposes only. It's not a substitute for hands-on training taught by a qualified instructor. Regular hands-on training is necessary to become proficient. Improper use of any equipment may cause serious injury or death. Think safe, act safe, be safe. Improper use of any equipment may cause serious injury or death is true when you look at structural collapse and you look at trench rescue. What we use with trench is the first ones we, we came out with were the lock stroke struts. As you see here, we got the lock stroke, the acne, and the acne extensions. <clears throat> We've got four sizes of lock stroke strut, five sizes of acne strut, but the small strut you see on the right in the middle, that's only a, a manual strut. There is no air fitting or air chuck on that strut. That strut just goes in. You put two bases on there. You adjust it over three inches. The collar hits the tube, and you're good to go. We got a series of four extensions for that series of, uh, of struts. Maximum load up to 80,000 pounds, one to one to four feet with the gray acne and the lock stroke struts. 20,000 pound workload with a four to one safety factor. Extensions, maximum of two, not to exceed three feet. It's designed for spanning shorter distances. It's used primarily in trench rescue, vehicle stabilization, structural shoring and elevator rescue. We've got a rule of thumb with the gray struts with the acne thread and the, and the, the lock stroke. The one, two, three rule. One strut, two extensions, not to go over three feet. That's not to go over three feet with the extensions. The gray struts are a great tool. They can be uh, adjusted from anywhere outside that trench, as you'll see further down the, the line with this webinar. We also use the longshore struts in trench. We've got five sizes of strut going anywhere from two feet up to 16 feet. We got four sizes of extension, 12 inch, 24 inch, 36 inch, and sorry, 12 inch, 24 inch, 48 inch, and 72 inch, six feet. Maximum load on the long shores is 80,000 pound up to eight feet. 20,000 pound workload with a four to one safety factor on those to eight feet. Extensions on the long shores, you can use a maximum of one extension per strut. It's designed for spanning longer distances. Used primarily in vehicle stabilization, structural shoring, trench rescue, high angle. Your rakers, your, your pods, and things like that. But we also use them in trenches because trench, it's a weird thing. It's not one trench, or I should say, not two trenches are the same. Only in training. Bases we use for trench rescue. We use swivel bases and we use rigid bases. The one on the left is a swivel base. It swivels for 20 degrees for 360 degrees around that plate. The one on the right is a standard rigid base. Basically, it's a 90 degree static base. Both bases come with a lock pin that defaults to the lock position. The thing is, when you're looking to put these on the struts, you've got to make sure they are on the struts as well as the extensions. On the piston end or the, the threaded shaft of the strut, there are four locating holes. You've got to make sure that that lock pin, 
locks into one of those holes. On the other side where the air chuck is, the static end, there's a groove. So if it goes on and, the, and you hear the click, then the pin is in. Control equipment. You see the picture on the left, we've got a G2 and a G3 controller. The picture in the middle, we've got a G3 regulator. And the one on the right, we've got the, the distribution modules. So you take a look at the controllers on the left. We got the, the G2, which is the one with the toggles. All controllers operate the same way. You got the green button as you inflate or shoot or pressurize, red button as you deflate, de energize, or whatever you want to call it. One difference with the controller on the right hand side, the G3, is you see the black button in between the two gauges, that big black button. That's a light, an LED light that lights up the gauges. That light can be changed. It's not a battery in there. The, the light is all self-contained. You'll just take the faceplate off and just replace it with a new light. All controllers come with the safety coupling now. As you can see, you've got the safety coupling on the G3, the safety coupling on the regulator, safety couplings on the modules. The regulator in the center is a little bit different than what you've seen. This is the G3 regulator. We've got the standard adjusting wheel. We've got the standard 347 uh, wheel to go to the cylinder. We've got the coupling as your outlet. Um, we've got the little knob on top, the quarter turn, that shuts the air off to the controls. If you take a look at the knob on top at the moment, it's across the body, and uh, that's shut off. If you quarter turn it, when it's in line with your, your cylinder nut and your, your coupling, then you get airflow into the controllers. The modules on the right, they are just a, a newer version of our, basically our white connectors. We've just made them more of a 90 degree of a T, like a, or looks like a T. So it's easier to control and it's easier to, to define what hoses are coming off of what module to what side of the controls. Hoses, <clears throat> every hose that comes out now has the safety coupling on there. If you take a look at the hose on the left, just the coupling itself, you'll see that, that big thumb wheel with the little pinholes in, that's the safety part of that coupling. If that piece is not screwed all the way up to that sliding, sliding collar, then that coupling is going to leak and you're not going to get any pressure going through to whatever you need to do. The one on the, on the right is when it's joined together and... The thumb wheel is all the way up to the shoulder of that slide. Now it's sealed. Now you've got air flowing. The reason we put safety couplings on everything now is you've all been there, where it's, it's downtime, it's time to take things apart. And you, you start taking things apart, you start taking the hoses apart. Then you come to where your air source is or the, the back of the control. You take the hose off either the air source or the control, then you're going to allow hissing noise because you haven't shut the air off the cylinder. That's what that safety coupling does. As you open it, air will come out of those little holes, and then you know something's wrong, so you can go back and take a look what the problem is, rectify the problem, take things apart without air blowing everywhere, or you may lose a hose where it's going to whip with a, with a force of air on there. Or even... If you have shut this air cylinder off and it's time to disconnect, but you didn't drain that system, by opening that collar, you'll hear the air come out and it'll drain the system for you by the time you, you uh, take the coupling off the nipple. Trench accessories. <clears throat> you got the whalers. They come in two sizes. They come in an eight foot and a, foot and a six foot. Uh, the the whaler, whaler rails are used for multi multitude of things. But in this application, they use for spanning panels in the trench. Uh, on the bottom, we've got a new control kit. It's called the trench control kit. We've got a G3 controller, G3 regulator, and six modules in there, along with seven hoses. The hoses we use are 32 feet. That allows the hose to get into a deeper trench. If your trench is uh, 12 feet deep, 15 feet deep, allows you to get in there so that the operator of the controls is not on the edge of the trench looking in because he doesn't know what to do.
to do. There's no hoses left, and that's as close as that's as close as he can get with the strut going to the depth it needs to go. Whaler connector. We get a whaler connector there. We can join the whales together. Now you see the four, four the set, the eight pins that's on there. The two pins at the end will fold in and lock. Then the the two pins in the center. Then you you do by hand. When it's the two pins in the center lock into the whale, you can unlock the ones on the end and it locks into the holes. At the bottom, we get a stop lock. Stop lock is there that fits into the whaler rails. It's, it's so you can put bases into the whaler rails locked in if you want to make a box and put the whole box into the trench. We do, I don't recommend that if the whaler's in the trench and you, you start shooting struts, that you try to put the stop locks in because it does not work because the base has got to make contact with that whale then slide under the stop block so if you're already pressurized does not work we don't use them if we use in whales individual we only use them if we build a box outside the trench and lower the whole box in as one unit thrust blocks up on top we've got an inside thrust block and an outside thrust block your inside thrust block has got that anchoring. It sits over your 2x12 strong back. We've got a swivel base as the cup going onto the strong back and a hinge base as the cup that's going to be for your diagonals. The outside thrust block is the one on the bottom that's got the three cups. Again, the center one's a swivel, and the two outside ones are basically a 45 degrees. We've got the L trench adapter kit. Some of you, this may look familiar for when you, if you do rakers and different things. They are the raker latch bases. We've got a one inch rigid strut, which is just a solid, solid, basically, as to say, a nipple goes into those. Those cups lock into that uh, whaler where the cutout is, and it keeps the whalers together if you're placing the whaler into an L trench or if you're going around a corner. Uh, it keeps those whalers together because there is not much play in that outside thrust block to get into that whaler. So it keeps it together. Last but not least is the picket we use. We use a 48 inch long picket, uh, one inch diameter steel picket. When you drive these things in, these need to be driven in two thirds of the way. So about three feet uh, to allow you to do what you need to do. With the pickets, if you take a look at the picket, we do a lot of testing up in Michigan with the uh, Musa Training Foundation. It's, I would recommend if anybody uh, is looking at trench, they're looking for some good training, I would recommend going to this. They do a lot of crazy stuff out there. And like I said, no trench is the same. Uh, they, they do they, The stuff they do up there with training and for testing is out of this world. We did a, a picket test, I think it was last year, where we angled pickets different ways. We put pickets in straight. We drove them in two-thirds of the way. Uh, it was funny, we had, we had it attached to a grip hoist and we had it attached to a dynamometer. And we found by driving a picket in straight, not angled, was the strongest way for the picket to uh, hold any object or any pull that needs to be done in a trench. It was weird, but it worked. Other accessories we got, we got the shoring hammer. If you take a look at the shoring hammer, it's got that spanner wrench feature at the back. Spanner wrench feature, is, it does what it's shown on the right-hand picture. It fits into the grooves of the collar of both uh, your acne strut and your longshore strut. That's handy to have in your pouch if you're going into the trench, if, you, if you're actually the rescuer that's egressing in. Because as you go down, you're going to shake the struts to make sure they're not loose. If they do come loose because of the, what happens behind the panels and what happens with the backfill, if it's loose, tighten it up with a, with a spanner wrench with a shore and hammer, tighten it in place, you're good to go. The tie tool is the tie tool we use that also fits in the grooves of the collar of the acne strut. So when it's placed, we can spin that collar to make contact with the tube to lock the strut out. It's a good tool. It beats up the collar a little bit, but it is a good, cool, good tool for that. We use it on painter's poles, adjustable painter's poles. We'll screw into the end of that so it makes it a little bit easier to use. The other piece you see there, that little, that semicircle, 
that attaches onto that hole at the top of your tie tool and that releases the lock stroke struts it goes in you see the little groove there we can twist it it opens up that collar of the lock stroke strut to de-energize or take down the lock stroke strut trench cushions we also do trench cushions these ones are square these are seven and a quarter psi cushions as you see there are no relief valves on there the reason we don't put relief valves on there is when they go behind the panels in the trench dirt is kicked on top of the bags and if there's a problem if the relief valve does open then dirt's going to get in and it's going to remain open so we don't use relief valves on the trench cushion kit we use two single controllers so the trench bags can be, be used anywhere in the trench individually we got 20 foot of uh, red hose and blue hose and a 16 foot of black hose that goes along with that if you take a look at the controllers the controllers have got the nipple as your inlet that's so you don't have to change regulators in the trench whereas the trench regulator will operate those cushions if you do operate cushions with the trench regulator when you adjust the regulator up adjust it to around about 100 psi because these are only seven and a quarter PSI bags, you've got the relief valve that sticks out on that control, but they take a lot of volume. If I were only to open up that regulator to 10 PSI, it's gonna take a while to fill that bag. The air goes in them slow and it's gonna take a while to fill that. We got two trench kits. We got a 12 short trench kit you see on the left, and we got a 16 short trench kit on the right. Multiple hoses, controller, regulator, shore and hammers, bases, and multitude of struts and extensions. On the 16, it's the same thing, but on the 16, we've included the trench, the, the trench bag kit on the bottom. So it it's a pretty good kit of what it is. Multitude of extensions. Okay, this is something I've done. I put in here. I made this up. The Acme Rescue Strut, we always get questions on the struts, especially when we use the Acme Rescue Strut on the Longshore Struts. Acme Rescue Struts, we, we pressurize to 200 PSI. The Longshores, we pressurize to 150. Why? Here's the reason we do this. The Acme Rescue Strut, the internal threaded shaft is two and a half inch diameter. So if I put 200 PSI into that uh, strut and hits that two and a half inch diameter on the acme threaded shaft it gives me around about 1200 foot pounds of force going against the panels that's what you need about we need about that 1200 foot pounds of force so if you take a look at the longshore strut in the longshore strut we've got three inch diameter of the threaded shaft so if i were to pressurize the longshore strut to 200 psi it'll give me upwards of 1800 foot pounds of force against that panel so by dropping the pressure of 50 PSI to 150, it gives me around about the same foot-pounds of force as the Acme Rescue Strut, around about 1,200 pounds. If you take a look at the, the little page on the, the right-hand side, I just did this because there's a lot of confusion out there with extensions and with bases and everything else. This, this is a nice little tool to have in your arsenal. I did it with both swivel bases, with both rigid bases, and the one in the middle is with one swivel and one rigid base because people out there do use one swivel and one rigid. If you take a look at the, the top one with the swivel bases, that's the most common. I use swivel bases in trench rescue. I don't use any rigid. The reason, the reason being is by using a rigid base, you've got to get that strong back exactly 90 degrees to the ground to use a, to use a rigid base. Otherwise, there's going to be a gap behind that base of which you've got to fill. So it makes contact. Remember, trench, we don't want any gap from one wall to the panel goes in. That's why we backfill, and we don't want a gap in the base. It's two swivel bases takes up for that gap. So what I did is if you're using just a six-inch extension with a strut, you're going to have nine and a half inches with a six-inch extension and the two swivel bases. So on the table for the for the for the four different struts you've got there we use in trench rescue i've got the numbers so with with the six inch extension the two swivels it starts out at 
28 and a half for the 19 into 25, and Angela 34 and a half. What this does, it allows you to put a complement of struts together using individual or using multiple extensions on that strut, and it gives you the figure that's there that you can actually read. Because if you take a look at the 25 to 36, and I put two six inch extensions on there with swivel bases, it saves the calculation. It's already there for you, uh, and you're good to go with that. I did it also from one swivel, from one one swivel and one rigid, because people out there do train with one swivel, one rigid. It's been taught since day one, and they still train with it. So I put that one. We never use two rigid bases in a in a trench. Sometimes you may if you're using whalers right down low, and you got to use a smaller strut. And the, the, the whalers are 90 degrees to each other. So with the two rigids, you add two inches instead of three and a half for the swivels. It may give you enough gap where you can go in and put that strut into place. Tabulated data. Everybody talks about tabulated data. I've only put one sheet of tabulated data up on, on this uh, webinar because... We've got a multitude of tabulated data pages, covers A soil, B soil, C soil. I only cover C soil. Reason is, there's a reason you, that you were responding to a trench collapse, because it's collapsed. If a trench has collapsed, if it's pre-disturbed, if there's water in or anything like that, it's type C soil. I wouldn't bother with A or B. I just go right to type C and job done. Then there's no thinking about this. There's no use in the pocket pentrometer. Uh, no thumb test on the dirt because you don't know how long the dirt's been out of the hole and this, that, and the other. C is conservative, and it gives you what you need. So if you take a look at the tabulated data there, it's using the two-to-one safety factor on that. This is what we have at the moment. This is what we have. It's tabulated data. Again, going back to, I do a lot with uh, with Musa Training Foundation, with Ron Zalaki and, and Aaron up there. And uh, Like I said, they're coming out with this new TOG, Trench Operations Guide with FEMA, and the tabulated data is going to be a little bit different. The reason I didn't put that tabulated data up there is because I don't know enough about it to explain it to you. So hopefully, hopefully, if I can sweet talk him, hopefully for the, the advanced trench webinar in January, hopefully I, I'm talking to Ron Zalaki to see if he can do it for us. He can go more in depth with this. He's, in my eyes, he is the trench expert. He's great at what he does, and he explains a lot more than what I can explain with this. So with the whaler on the right-hand side, it's just we've got the whaler up with dug fur oak, dug fur oak, dug fur oak with different different sizes. And we got the, the whaler strength factors there. This was all done off the, off the Internet with capacities for Douglas fir and oak different times with, with our engineers. Uh, like I said, with this, with this tabulated data for the whalers, we've tested whalers. We've tested whalers with Musa Training Foundation. Uh, we tested ours. We tested wood. And the one that's not on there because it wasn't available at the time is an LVL, a laminated beam. Uh, Musa uses laminated beams. They're great. They're pre-engineered beam that you screw and glue together and they're really strong. So with that, if in the advanced trench, they're going to maybe dive a little bit into the laminated beams, what they do. But at the moment, this is what Paratex got. So if you want tabulated data, this is what you're going to get. Hopefully, we'll be able to work with Ron and work with the guys up at the Musa Training Foundation about doing an actual tabulated data sheets for Paratech uh, using the new... Uh, figures they've got and, and the new the new graphs they've got with uh, what they come up with with the PhDs. Okay, trench rescue one on one. How do I get the strut in the trench? If you take a look at this strut is placed, you're going to put all the struts together away from the trench. You're going to bring the strut to the end at one end of the trench. Make sure the hose is attached. A lot of times they forget to put the hose on and it, you're going to bring it all back out and start over again. So with it laying on the ground pad at the end of the trench, 
Your two rescuers are going to grab hold of the ropes. They're going to pick the strut up and walk it down those ground pads. Put it on your strong backs and lower it to where it needs to be. Then you're going to soft place up to 50 PSI and go from there with what pressures you need. Straight trenches. If you take a look at the two pictures, it's showing both Acme rescue struts and the long shows being used in a straight trench. On the left, we got the, the Acme's going in. That trench is around about, I'd say, seven, eight feet deep. Looking at seven and eight feet deep, you only really need to use two struts in there. The first strut is going to go two foot from the lip or the top of the trench. The bottom strut's going to go two foot from the bottom of the trench. And there needs, to be, there needs to be four foot span in between. We use three struts in a situation like this because it's training. In training, we put as many struts as we can in there for practice. So the same with the gold struts on the right-hand side. Like I said, there's air fittings on the gold struts on the long shores, so they can be used in trenches. And as I was saying earlier, not every trench is the same. Okay, there's always a question that going from back from day one, when Jim Gargan did this, uh, he started this trench uh, trench collapse uh, rescue, and going back to what sequence do we place struts in the trench? Well, back then in the day, we, we've used, we go with wood, we go with screw jacks, we go with different things on there. For those pieces of equipment, the sequence is normally top, middle, bottom, or middle, top, bottom. The reason being is for the screw jack, for wood, you've got to enter that trench to pressurize and put them in place. So when you enter the trench, you can only go waist below either the lip or waist below the shore that's in there. So that's why they go with the top, top one first, then they can go down another three feet, then go down another three feet to put in place. So it's always been either top, middle, bottom, or middle, top, bottom. Now, today, when we're using Paratex, when we put the struts in the trench, it doesn't make a difference how deep we put them. We can pressurize them, and we can lock them out at any depth from the top of the trench. So with Paratech, we can put any sequence in there. We can go bottom, bottom middle, top, top, middle, bottom, middle, top, bottom, middle, bottom, top, Whatever you want to do, doesn't make a difference. But what I will tell you is when we train, we train on nice square trenches. So it's it's easy for the for your sequence to go in. We can put the top one in, we can put the middle one in, then we can put the bottom one in, then set the rescuers in, nailing the bases as you go down, minimum two nails per base each side. So that's not a problem. But <clears throat> with this, when we put them in, the trench is going to determine which strut goes in first. Imagine it's a pre-disturbed trench, maybe a landfill. They build houses on the landfills these days. Maybe a landfill. You've dug, they dug a trench to put a water main in, and there's a tire or something protruding out from the center of that trench. You're not going to put the top strut in first or the bottom strut in first on this one. The reason being it's going to create a fulcrum point or a seesaw with the, with, with the middle, pan, middle of the panel up against your tire or up against whatever's protruding that trench, then by the time you put the other strut in, you're going to have to use a lot shorter strut, and it's not going to span and push that panel back against that wall. So you're going to use a lot of uh, backfill. So with something protruding in the middle of that trench, you're going to put the middle strut in first to hold it. Then you, you'll most probably put the bottom and the top in at the same time. So it doesn't seesaw, or it doesn't make that a fulcrum point. When we put them, when we when we put a middle strut in, the middle strut is normally a temporary strut in a trench this deep. Reason is it holds everything together. As you see, you're not gonna have rescuers holding all the panels. You're gonna have you're not gonna have tie backs going back to pickets holding the panels in place while you put the struts in. By soft placing a temporary shore in the middle of that panel, holds the panels together. It frees up the rescuers to do what they need to do. A trench is labor intensive for the first hour. Reason is that a lot of work's got to be done. With not only your equipment on the on in the cold zone, with your shores and your backfill and everything else, and 
getting your panels and your, your, your ground pads together. We need a couple of different teams. We need a ground pad team. We need a shore in team. You need a team. You may have to remove the file pile that's there. It's in the way because operators, some operators are not nice enough to move the spoil pile back over, over two feet from the lip. They just dump it there. Why? So they can push it back in easier after the job is done. But like I said, there's a lot of work to be done in that first, first hour or so. When everything's in place, it only requires a handful of guys lowering, lowering the shores, pressurizing the shores, making sure the fishers are under the ground pads, checking on those and checking on everything else. So it's only use a handful of guys in the, the two to three hour phase of this. T trench, a little bit of a different animal. Soft placements of struts in a tree trench, T trench is critical so that you don't blow out the corner sections of the T. So if you take a look at this, the sequence of this is going to remain the same. It's going to determine what, what's going to happen with the trench. Normally, if you're there on T trench, is one of those corners are blown out and fell into the trench and your rescuer, where your rescuer is in, the, in that trench at the moment is most probably where your patient or your victim is. So I'm not going to put my top, top strut in first because it's going to be a big hole there. So most probably my middle strut or where there's wall behind that panel. It may be down six feet. So I'm going to put those struts in first so it holds the panel in place. With that, you're going to shoot them simultaneously to around about 50 PSI and work your way up from there. Then you're going to either place the bottom or the tops in. You're going to place the top in at 50. Then you're going to backfill and pressurize, backfill and pressurize until it becomes solid. Remember, when you put these panels in place, these panels need to be 90 degrees to the to the, the bottom of the trench, if possible. A lot of times, there's going to be a little bit of angle on them. So take a look at your struts. Your struts, you're going to get your struts as straight as possible. You have got a little bit of leeway on these struts. You've got about a 10 to 15 degree leeway, where these struts can be angled 10 to 15 psi. Uh, sorry, 10 to 15 degrees. With that, it's not enough degrees to push the panels out, push the panels sideways, or do anything else. If it's over 15 degrees, by pressurizing those struts, it may have a tendency to either push that panel out of the top of the trench or push the panel either way up or down the trench. So you're going you're gonna to shoot these. You're going to soft place simultaneously. Then you take it up the desired pressure. If you're using the Acmes, it's going to be 200 PSI. If you're using the long shores, it's going to be 150 PSI. T trenches, you are going to use whalers, as you see on the picture on the right. The struts on the picture on the right are eight feet on center, and it's sandwiched in the middle panel. We're going to discuss a little bit about whalers in the next webinar, but I'll go a little bit on what we do with whalers a little bit further down. L trench. If you take a look, we got two photographs of the L trench. On the L trench, you're going to lower the bottom whaler to the ground first. Reason being, with that whaler lowered into the ground, when you put your soft placement shores in, your temp shores or whatever you, you put in there, then you can bring the whaler up towards the bottom of the shore and pin the whaler in place with the, with, the sh with the struts to hold it. That way you don't have to try to fish the whaler through the struts going down to the bottom where it needs to be. Then you can just lift the top one over, put the top one in place, and you're good to go. If you take a look at the number sequence I've got in there, the number one are the first shores that go in. Number two are the second shores that go in. Number three, we normally put diagonals in there with uh, our, excuse me, with our thrust blocks. Excuse me, what a second, while I have a drink. Don't forget, guys, to ask questions on the right-hand side of your YouTube screen. and The RSMs are there to answer any questions you've got. I'm concentrating more on the PowerPoint, so it's hard for me to look down and at least see what the questions are. But going back to that number sequence, the number three is where we put the, no the, the diagonals in normally. Like I say, going back to Musa Training Foundation, we do a lot, a lot of work with them. They test a lot of systems. And by putting the diagonals in there, is what happens with that, it tends to have a tendency to push those panels down the trench if I pressurize them. What we have done with this is 
your, your horizontal struts, the ones and twos, go to 200 PSI. Then your threes then will drop to about half that, maybe 100, maybe 150 PSI. But the problem is it still has a tendency to push those panels down. Why? If you take a look at a sheet of fin form, sheet of fin form is laminated sheet, and it's painted. So there's no friction behind that sheet. And if that, that trench wall is wet or it's not making full contact for friction, it's going to slide. That's the reason behind that. So Musa Training Foundation are looking at different systems to put in place. So we don't have to put those diagonals in, but the trench remains strong. And, and that's what we're looking at now. But the diagonals are still going to be used because that's what you're trained with. But be very, very careful with that. I have seen them push down. I have been there when they've done the test and seen the panels push down. Remember, if the panels push down, you're going to lose all the stabilization in your trench. Take a look at the picture on the right. This is a trench we did up in, uh, I think this one, yeah, this one was up in Musa. So if you take a look at the whalers, we're using the LVLs, the laminated beams. And what we what they did up in Michigan, if you take a look at the strut uh, to the top of the page, as you see, that strut is close to the edge of that the panel on the T, on the, uh, on the corner of that L. It's also going to have another one on this corner and if you take a look behind the whaler we've got uh, spacers behind the whaler so the strut makes contact with the lvl makes contact with the spacer makes contact with the panel makes contact with the dirt now once that's in place in your backfill you can pressurize because then you've only got around about maybe three feet to the corner of that uh, outside outside corner of that trench in both directions that whaler should be strong enough to hold what you need to hold or until you can go in there and put put what you need to put in place. Uh, if Ron Zalocki does our advanced trench, he can go a little bit into what they do with this. And uh, believe me, I do recommend, again, if you want to do a trench class, I do recommend going there. They do a symposium late in the year, every year, where they, they, they put crazy stuff together. They do testing. They test systems. So you can actually see different things failing or how that failure you can wreck you can rectify that failure by a trench that will hold deep trenches different animal all together here you're using a multitude of panels stacked on top of each other as you see the picture on the left the amount of shows you're going to use with this picture on the right you see the ladders are in place going back to the ladders i didn't mention earlier with the ladders Always, before you start any trench rescue, put a ladder in place. Always make sure that if there's a, a 25-foot great or greater run, you need two ladders in place. So we always, we always try to put two ladders in place so it gives you egress and an exit out of that trench in either direction. So take a look at the, the sequence on the right-hand picture of how these panels are put in place. So your struts are going to go into the bottom panels. And your struts are going to go into the top panels. So you, you got offset struts, which is perfectly okay. Nothing wrong with that. The panels at the top are leaning a little bit. That you can't help because of what it is. It's a deep trench. It's hard to get backfill down behind all those panels, especially down below. Here, what they tend to do, they, they, put, a pan, they put a strut in the middle of the panels on the bottom to hold the panels, and they put a strut in the middle on the top, hold the panels. Uh, basically, they show from the bottom up. Then they, they put the soft place, the, the soft place to strut, struts. They put the back fill in with whatever you need. Remember, you can use you can use cushions, you're going to use dirt, you're going to use wood, you can use anything you can get your hands on for back fill, just so as long as there's no gap behind that panel. So if you take a look at the picture on the left. You see those silver, those silver rails, to say uh, a word, basically. Those are lip bridges. Lip bridge allows you to get close to that trench, especially, especially if you take a look that that trench is given away a little bit further back than the panel itself. So if I were to stand that far back, I'm not going to see where my strut's going to go down that trench. 
I'm going to be totally rely on the squad boss at the end of the trench telling me what to do. And again, it's hard for him. He can only see what he's looking at. It's hard for him to see where the strut is on that strong back going down that low. So they use lip bridges. If you take a look, we got a six by six back about four feet off that trench. Then we got the six by six span in the trench. Then we put the lip bridges on the, on the trench so it allows us to get to the edge of that trench. Remember, if, you, if you've got a, a, a slide where the, the lip of the trench has slid into the trench and trapped your, your, your worker down the bottom, then that lip, the lip of that trench may be four feet back from the actual uh, belly of the wall. So how are you going to get in there? Lip bridges is the way to go. Those are aluminum lip bridges you can, you can buy online. They, I think they got a 700-pound capacity. Uh, they, they, they're light and they're really good. You can also make them out of wood and plywood. That's not a problem. It's a cheaper way to go. But with a 16-foot lip bridge made out of wood, where are you going to store it? If you store it outside, the wood's going to go rotten, and it's not going to be as strong, whereas the aluminum will stay where it is. You power wash it off, and it's not going to degrade. So that's the deep trench. Like I say, I'm not an instructor, so I'm not going into depth on this. Uh, but it gives you a little bit of what an actual deep trench looks like. Up in Musa Training Foundation, they dig down to anywhere from 15 to 16 feet. And it's cool to actually go and do this. And it's cool to actually watch this being done. It's, it's awesome the way they, they do it up there. And instead of taking hours to shore a trench together, the way they teach you up there takes minutes. And it's just unbelievable. Okay, backfill. <clears throat> Looking at two, two types of backfill there. Excuse me. Rule of thumb with backfill, especially using cushions, it's half a PSI per foot. Example. If my backfill is six feet deep in the trench behind the panel, then there needs to be three PSI of pressure in that cushion. The cushion on the left is just the regular, the seven and a quarter PSI cushion, the yellow ones. The ones on the right is the 14 and a half medium pressure cushions. You can still use those for backfill. You can use high pressure bags for backfill, wood, dirt, and anything else. Some of the reasons we use cushions if you take a look at, at the, the hole, it needs to backfill on both left and the right. There's a lot of expansion on those cushions, and it's taken up a lot of gap between the wall and the panels. Imagine trying to fill that with dirt. It's going to take you forever in a day. Plus then, where, where's your ground pad going to go? Your ground pad's going to go on top of the dirt, which I've seen it done. Then actually then they're using the backfill as their stance for the dirt. If you take a look at the, the picture on the left, they've got the aluminum uh, lip bridge. And on the right, they're using a ladder with a 2 by 12 on there for a lip bridge using uh, the, the, the aluminum ladder going across your 4 by 4s so they can get closer to that trench. <clears throat> okay, short in the top, back to the whale. Again, I... First time I saw this done, again, was up in uh, Michigan with the Musa Training Foundation. Now, imagine your, your, your slough on that side wall is gone, totally gone. It's back about six feet, four to six feet, say, like, like it is there. How am I going to show that trench and backfill that panel from coming back into that hole? There's a couple of ways you can do that. This is one of them. I put this picture in because this picture is cool. And... Perhaps a lot of you haven't seen this. So the picture on the top left is they've staked a whaler to the ground, back off of the ground pad. As you see, that ground pad is looking at it maybe eight feet away from the panel where that, that whaler is. So what they've done, they've come in and they put uh, two 610s in place. And they put it, they, they, they manually put it to the back of the, Fin form, there's most probably a whaler there that's resting on. So they back shored that panel back to a whaler off of the trench to hold that panel in place while they put the, the struts in. 
The other way it can be done, if you see that center picture of that two by 12 in between the two long shows, you can also drop a strut in there and do the same thing. Drop a strut in, so do a soft placement of the strut, the strut on the other side, push him back, and you're good to go. Again, it's cool the way it works. They show different things. They try different things. And they only they only put put to practice what works. Okay, this was a, the Trench University we did last year. I just want to show you this. If you take a look at the facility we had, we had our our excavators, engineers, local 150, which is close to the factory in Illinois. It's an indoor facility where they can dig down to 15 feet. They use it all year round for their training. So they, they allow us to come in every now and again to do a, do a trench class. Illinois Fire Service Institute goes in there and does all their trench classes there. They can, it's, 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 unbelievable. it's an unbelievable facility that we use. But if you take a look at the bipod we're using there, we, we, the heaviest thing we could find because it is an excavator's local, was a bucket. So we put a bucket on a victim in our trench just as a, as a demonstration and to take a look at what, it, what we could do using the bipod, lifting a load. So what we did, we used two grip hoists. We used two T28 grip hoists, which is a 4,000 pound grip hoist. If you take a look at the picture on the left, you'll see the two lines. It's attached to the excavator. The one on the left is holding the bipod at the angle. And the one on the right is uh, creating an English reeve. If all of you do rope rescue, you know where an English reeve is, where it allows you to, to lower and lift using maybe one or two lines going through a, a number of uh, pulleys. So the picture on the right, if you take a look, at the head of the bipod, we've got two snatch blocks. Then we've got a traveling snatch block attached to the bucket. We're using the one grip voice, the one line is going to go up through one snatch block, down through your traveling snatch block, back up through the other snatch block, and to an anchor at the other side. Remember, on the other side of that trench, you may not be able to get a vehicle or, or a, anything in there, so you may have to do a picket or tie to whatever you need to tie to. So, using the two grip hoists, using the English reef, the one holding the, the, the bipod head, positions the head over, over where you need to go. Then we'll take up on the grip hoist with the English reef, because we got the two opposing pulleys at the top, one's coming back to the left to your anchor, one's going back to the right to the anchor, so that bipod's not going to move. Then the cable feeds through the one to the left, through your traveling pulley, lifts the bucket off your patient. That's just something we put together using an English reeve with a bipod. I put it in here because perhaps you haven't seen this, you haven't thought of this. Uh, we do make equipment for this also actual trench rescue I put this I put this these pictures in because this trench is a bit of a crazy trench this was an actual in Chicago I work close with Chicago special ops and they send me all this stuff and we take a look and we review it and we we we, we do do all the talking and the debrief on what they do this was a trench dug under the patio of a three-story apartment building. So I got three three patios. You got the lower, the middle, and the top. So the trench was dug under the lower one. As you can see, and as I said earlier, not every trench is the same, especially when you do it in anger, when it's out there and you respond to it. As Ron Zalaki with Musa Ta uh, Training Foundation knows, the amount of trenches he's been on, not everyone's the same. There's some strange, crazy stuff that happens at Trench Rescue. So this one was a little bit crazy. It was under that patio. If you take a look on the left. They, they, dug, they dug the hole. So the spoiled pile is not a problem because it's away from the hole. But you've got a two or three foot gap where the rescuers have got to go under that patio to see what's going on. So on the bottom patio, they lifted up all the boards so you can see in. And as you can see, it's a little bit tight and... There's some crazy stuff happening there. Going back to the, the same the same trench rescue, this is what it looks like under that patio. So we had two two rescuers in the trench. The one with the red hat, he was he was the actual guy that was trapped. 
the guy with the gray shirt actually went in there to help and rescue him. Then he got trapped because they had a secondary collapse. It trapped and broke his leg. So now the problem is with the fight department, they're going to deal with two patients instead of one. And if you take a look, they're actually using full-size panels in there. So to feed that panel under that patio and get it into place and short up this trench, it was more of a hole than a trench. If you take a look at that patio, patios are around about 12 foot by 12 foot. The hole's a lot smaller than that. The hole may be 8 or 10 feet by 8 or 10 feet. I don't know, I wasn't there. So basically, they put the panels in and they cross shored. Problem is with cross shoring like that, it takes away the, the, the way to get your, your patient out of that trench, especially if you've got to use a backboard or a Stokes basket. So what do they do? Bottom picture, shop uh, uh, a rescue vac truck. No, it's not a rescue vac truck, it's just a vac truck. So they, they had all the equipment with the, the rescue vac, uh, and they had the step downs going in, went through the patio. The truck was parked, I think it was about three, three or 400 feet away from the trench itself because the truck had to go in the alley or on the street and feed the, feed the lines in. Line came in as they were digging. As you can see, there's not much room to dig to get the patient out or get two patients out. This was a successful rescue. They got both patients out alive and on the way to hospital. After this, and after another, another trench rescue they had in Chicago, which was on a football field of a high school, which involved pea gravel, after this, they purchased a VAC truck. So the city of Chicago has got a dedicated VAC truck with driver for, for trench rescue or any other rescuers out there that needs, the aggregate needs to be vacuumed up. Night operations. In the state of Illinois, part of the criteria is one day you got to do night operations. Well, it's hard to do night operations in a day. Going back to the facility that we use, the local 150, we can close the doors. There are no windows in the place and black the place out. So this 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 is this is pretty cool because you don't do a lot of teaching in the night with trench rescue. Same same with structural collapse and anything else. Always during the day. So this is totally blacked out. So they're going to set up with both helmet lights and just hand lights until they get the equipment if they have it out of the trailer. If you take a look at the picture on the left, they got one of those inflatable scene lights they can use. But it causes problems with shadows and everything else. If you take a look at the picture on the right hand side, they've got a, they've got a, maybe a halogen light working in there. But if you take a look at the top of that trench where the where the rescue was standing, you can hardly see. So trip hazards there are crazy. You cannot see them. You trip over them during the day. Imagine the nighttime. So they put everything together with artificial lighting and do the rescue with artificial lighting. It's pretty cool. It's it's definitely a must if you've never done it in the nighttime. It's it opens up your eyes to the factors of the round and what happens. As you know, trench rescue is a is a lengthy procedure, depending on what time of day the collapse happens. It's normally around about finishing time, and it does go dark. So you will do nighttime operations in the real world. But this is just some of the training they do with, with nighttime operations. What a mess. What a mess. Now, it's not uh, this one thing I will say. Uh, when, I, when I'm up in Michigan with the guys, uh, we believe it. It's not trench rescue unless it rains. And when it rains uh, and you've got a muddy mess like this, this is what happens to your control equipment. Now, this, this is what happens to your struts as well. Now, what do we do in a situation like this? Because if you take a look, especially with mud on them, all the buttons look the same. Take a look at the, the two controllers on the right-hand right picture. One's a G1, one's a G2. The G2, the green, the green button is up on top, and the G1, the green button is on the bottom. Now, imagine those buttons are covered with dirt. You can't see the colors. You've operated one, now you, you grab the other one to operate. So that's something that we deal with. Always have, if you're operating the controls, always have a rag with you so you can wipe those buttons and wipe the gauges. And you'll be good to go. 
it was weird because we never, never had a failure of equipment in that mess. It was unbelievable. For me, it was a little bit of a nightmare because I thought I was going to have to uh, do a lot of stripping down, doing a lot of cleaning and this, that, and the other. But we never had anything fail, even with the hoses. Because if you take a look at that controller on the left-hand side, with the way those couplings are, you can't even tell which is the slide and which is the, the lock on that coupling to push up the place. So, what a mess. Always have a bucket of water close to the person that's operating the controls. Or the per and the person who's doing the, the combination of shores that go in the trench. Reason is you can take the hose with a coupling, put it into the bucket of water, and just shake it around so it rinses the dirt off. Work it a little bit, and you're good to go. Don't submerge the controllers in the bucket of water. You can up to the bottom of the gauges. Don't submerge the gauges. Because the gauges are an air gauge, not a glycerin fill gauge, they are open inside, they will rust up, and they will stop working. Just wipe the gauge and wipe the controllers and the regulators. Wipe the couplings off, make sure it works, wipe the nipples off, you can put it all together. Lubrication, this is a question that's always asked, no matter where I am in the world. After cleaning the struts, and the cup seal on the threaded shaft needs to be lubricated. So always questions about this. What do I use? Well, if you take a look at the tuber glue on the right, I found this, and you can get it online, you can get it at, at retail stores. It's a little bit expensive for what it is, but it's it's a food-based grease. They use it on a lot of, lot of a lot in the food industry for their, their equipment. What I tell fire departments all across the world with, with lubricate in that uh, O-ring or that cup seal is use the grease that's good in the temperatures you work in. Basically, if you, if you work, take Chicago, that's where I'm based. In the wintertime, it can get down to minus 55 degrees in Chicago. And in the summertime, it can get up over 100 degrees. So I don't really want to use a grease that below 30 degrees, it solidifies, and above 90 degrees, it turns itself into water. With a food-based with a food food based synthetic grease on the right, this has got good values for both minus and plus. Doesn't solidify, does not melt. Now, you can use a lithium grease, that's fine. We've used lithium grease, I've used lithium grease, only problem is with lithium grease is when you put lithium grease on your seals, it softens the seal. And what that does, your seal doesn't last as long. If you look after your struts uh, and the seals and make sure they lubed up and all that, clean them, uh, they last you around about anywhere from three to five years. Using lithium grease, you may have to replace them every year or at least every two years. So that's what I say. Use a grease that's good for the temperatures you work in. Remember, your you struts are stored on, on either a truck or a trailer. A lot of times, that truck and trailer are stored inside. Inside, you may be at 60 to 70 degrees. Great. Nothing wrong with that. But if anything happens, that truck rolls. If, it, if you're 70 degrees inside and it rolls out to a 40, 40 degree, 20 degree, minus 10 degrees, it sits there for a while. So that strut gets cold. Grease solidifies or melts. Don't, don't put grease, WD-40, or oil on the threads of the, of the strut itself. There is an O-ring at the top of that strut, top of that threaded shaft that the collar butts up against. That O-ring is just there as a bumper. It's got no other capacity. It's just a bumper to stop that collar locking up against the end of that strut. If you lose it, just order another one. It doesn't take away from operation on that strut. If you are, or if you do want to lube up those threads on that shaft, use a dry lubricant. The dry lubricant goes on wet, but it dries. That way, nothing's going to stick to it. Not sand, not dust, not anything's going to stick to that uh, dry lubricant. And put it back in the tube. Do it in operation. If that trub strut does come apart and the threaded shaft does drop on the ground. Your, your seal does get all muddied up and everything. 
Just take a gloved hand, wipe the seal down, pop it back in that tube, it'll work just fine. I guarantee you could be in the middle of a desert, and if you take that strut with you and drop that tube up, it's going to find water. I was in Texas A&M, down in Teeks doing a class. We were out in the back doing trench class. Strut came apart. There's no water there. But strut found water. Came back all muddy, and that's what you do. Lubricant for your hoses and your lock pins. I use WD-40. On the, the, the hose itself, you see that the, the collar, the, sl the slide collar. I just squirt WD-40 down there on the, on the ball bearings and everything that's inside. Squirt it inside to lube up the O-ring. Move it around a bit, make sure it's free. I also use the same WD-40 on the lock pins. I squirt, use a little red tube that's on the WD-40 can. I squirt a little bit of WD inside on the pin. I work the lock pin, and you're good to go. That's all you need to do. Support. At Paratech, we do a lot of support. We get we get asked to support from five different fire departments all over the well, I say all over the world. Whereas uh, they do an event, they haven't got enough equipment. Any chance you can bring a trailer, a truck, a van, or whatever out. So we do a lot of support. Picture on the left is my old trench trailer, and the picture on the right is my new one. The one on the right is an urban search and rescue trailer. The only difference between that trailer and the trench trailer is it hasn't got any panels on there. But we're there to support with equipment. Not so much your ground pads and your panels. We've got vans and trailers across the country. We've got vans and trailers over in over in Europe and everything everywhere else. Whereas you can contact your RSM uh, and ask for support on some on things on big events like this, uh, and they can uh, give you the criteria what you need to do this. Uh, if you don't know your RSM in your in your particular area, contact Paratech or send an email to paratech.com. And they will get back to you with your RSM's name and number and email. So we do support. Again, support, we don't charge for support either. But because we got minimal amount of equipment with regards to trailers and vans and trucks, and there's a lot of support that goes on, and there's a lot of events that go on throughout the country and throughout the world. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this webinar on Trench. Like I said, I am not an instructor. My name is Nigel Leatherby. I'm a training manager with Paratech. And hope to see you back for the Whaler one and the Advanced Trench in January. Again, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us today.